So I'm here now with um, Blair Erickson, the uh, director and writer of Banshee Chapter. That's right. Welcome. Hey, great to be here. Um, so to start off with, um, the film is um, based to an extent on real events, mm -hmm. well, real kind of governmental programmes at least. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? How did you first kind of get interested in that? Sure. Um, yeah, a couple of years ago I started looking into kind of the things that our government had gotten involved in. Um, it was right when we started talking about domestic spying and things like that, modern issues, but I started looking back at other things we had done in the 20th century and kind of these creepy programs that our government had gotten involved in and nothing had ever come of it. We just sort of let it happen. Um, and became, it came, became sort of the theme of the story when we think about you know ghost stories, it's always our past coming back to haunt us. And I thought, what if you looked at that on sort of a national level of the national things that we had done coming back to haunt us? So that was sort of where we got into it. So um, uh, in the film, there's kind of, there are um, bits of news footage and stuff like that. I mean, how important was, was it for you to kind of ground the film in that sort of kind of reality? And how do you think that kind of affected the horror of the film? Yeah, I mean, it, it was very important because um, I think so many of these films we, we, we say, oh, based on a true story, but it's so ludicrous. Whereas in this case, what the, the true story was based on was, in, was itself and so incredibly ludicrous. We wanted to weave in as much of that as possible so that people would say, did that really happen? And then go search for themselves and find out, in fact, it did. And it was a lot closer to reality than they thought. Um, you kind of explore, well, to me, it seemed like um, there were quite a few elements in the film that harked back to the kind of counterculture era that actually was kind of alongside these kind of governmental happenings. Yes. And there's a character in the film played by Ted Levine that mm -hmm. bears more than a passing resemblance to a certain gonzo journalist. Yes. Um, can you talk about that sort of the kind of counterculture and also kind of the drug culture aspect of yeah. it as well? Because I thought that was quite interesting. So, I mean, the real program was, you know, by many historical accounts, the reason we had the counterculture. The counterculture didn't just happen at the same time. Um, LSD and a lot of those experimental hallucinogens came out of this government program to try to mind control people. And the counterculture people, we, I mean, so his character has some resemblance to many counterculture. We actually wove several in, and one of them was himself uh, a patient in the program. So it was no coincidence that th these drugs came into our population at that time. Um, and it was, I think, a lot of, we hint at it in the film, we don't write out say it, but I hope that a lot of people will pick that up and go find out more about that. I think, yeah, I think it's quite, quite a kind of fun aspect of the film. Um, in terms of kind of the way that you shot it, and um, it goes from kind of documentary style footage to more kind of cinematic footage. What, where was your kind of decision to have that kind of mix? Yeah, I think um, it was. I always I always like to open with something a little you know unique. I always like films that do that. So I thought it would be fun to kind of do something different for the opening, so that you feel that the film changes and evolves into something different as you go through it, and you don't feel like you're just seeing the same thing repeat. Um, for us, when we were shooting in 3D and we, the way we were shooting it, it seemed like you'd start it off with the idea of you're immersing the audience, that the camera is a character, but you don't want to do a whole found footage thing, you want to just sort of place that feeling and then carry that all the way through. So it starts off a little bit found footage and then slowly weaves more into documentary style, but it maintains that feeling that you're in the scene every time. Um, and where did the decision come from to, to shoot 3D? It was, you know, I wanted to try it because it was, you know, if you're going to immerse people, it, it was the next logical step. If you're going to do, you know, lots of long takes, if you want the character to feel like, you know, it is a, the camera's in the scene and you're with there, um, 3D really made sense. So it was trying it in sort of a different way that wasn't about stuff popping out, but rather using it as a way to make you understand where the space is and when the camera looks around the corner, what are you seeing, and that sort of thing. Um, one of my favourite um, things about the film is that you had um, several scenes that I thought were really effective in terms of a very slow, deliberate dread. And they are, you know, they are quite kind of nerve-wracking and very tense. I mean, is that the sort of horror that you um, respond to most? Yeah. I mean, where does that... Yeah, I think, um, you know, and it's not even just horror. I think there's a lot, of, a lot of great directors that do that where they'll take a scene and it's, you know, that classic kind of you tell the audience there's a bomb under the desk at the beginning of the scene, but you don't let it go off right away. And I think you play with the idea of how long can you stretch this out to really make, you know, people lean forward on the edge of their seat knowing something bad's going to happen, but not sure when and what it's going to be. You've got quite a few, there's some really wonderful locations in the film, and yeah. it seems to kind of be kind of dotted around the place. Can you tell us a bit about the shoots? Sure. Um, we shot primarily in Albuquerque, which stands in for Nevada, 
because um, it's just it's it's more set up for film. We worked with a lot of the crew from Breaking Bad and some of that stuff um, because they know their way around Albuquerque, and we we used a lot of the locations that um, really worked well at the the studio level on there. So a lot of that stuff is actually set. So the basement when they go in, there's actually no basements in Albuquerque. So we had to build an entire basement set that she would walk into and things like that. And as far as you know, Chamber Five, which is probably the craziest one. Um, that was an abandoned um, semiconductor factory once upon a time, and it had this crazy basement that just went on for miles. And so we figured that was the best location for Chamber 5. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a phenomenal production design team, and they just came in and just made it look as just absolutely bonkers as they could. Um, as a kind of first-time director, you're working with I mean, people like Ted Levine, a massively experienced actor, and Breaking Bad crew and all that sort of stuff. How was that kind of experience for you? Were you kind of learning on your... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, of course, a learning <laughs> process. And, um, I mean, we're a very small-budget film, and, you know, you're kind of going out there, and there is that sort of run-and-gun flavor to the story anyway, so we were able to get away with a lot more. But one of the kind of the, the unique things that we were doing that let us kind of get away with, I would say, crazier shooting schedules and things like that was we used almost no studio lighting for almost the entire second half of the film everything you see is exactly how it was lit so if they have a flashlight and they're running through the chamber five it was just the flashlight um, and things like that and doing that allowed it allowed the camera a lot more movement a lot more freedom to kind of try things and get away with um, different crazy shot setups um, uh, have you got any uh, good anecdotes from the time from the shoot uh, Albuquerque is full of horrible, <laughs> scary stuff, and um, we we were staying in one of the houses there, and I woke up in the middle of the night, it was like 4 o'clock in the morning, and I felt something very heavy on my arm, and uh, I switched on the light, and there was this poisonous centipede about this long wrapped around my arm, <laughs> and the first thing I did was I flung it off and began uh, yelling, and it was crawling through my bed, and then I got out my phone, and I was like, I gotta film this, because no one will ever believe this. <laughs> So that was the second thing I did. But yeah, it's uh, there was that. There were rattlesnakes, and uh, we stepped. In, I stepped in a rattlesnake pit when we were out shooting at night, and uh, tarantulas. Just a really uh, intense place to shoot. Very fun. <laughs> um, what are you uh, kind of working on at the moment? Are you looking at um, at your kind of next project? Yes. Or? Yeah. Um, I'm working on a. The next one is a little bit more. I would say a little bit more upbeat. Um, but uh, you know, still sort of playing a little bit in the supernatural area with uh, a story about a girl who um, is falling in love with a guy in the 90s and is killed tragically and then shows up almost 20 years later and looks exactly the same. And it's a story kind of about death and, and loss and how we don't, don't do or do not move past um, tragedies that happen in our lives. Oh, that sounds like a really interesting idea. I mean, is that, it sounds like, I mean, from Banshee Chapter and also from that, it seems like definitely you're kind of airing on the kind of quirkier side of kind of genre filmmaking. Is yeah, I, I like, I just like kind of pushing and playing because I think, you know, the way, the way a horror market is right now, you have to work so low budget, but if you're going to work that low budget, why not work in, with stuff that you wouldn't see in the studio system? So, you know, you experiment with stuff that's maybe a little more political, like about government conspiracies or, you know, things that people might not have tried. Um, and you hope it works, and you know, hopefully people will respond to it. But yeah, I think that's one of the, that's one of the good things about being outside the system. Cool. Thank you very much. Cool. Wonderful.